one of the questions that keeps coming up, talking about down and out Paris and London, talking about all of Orwell's various down and out experiences, is how true it is. Now, we may believe, we may not believe what Orwell writes, we may be convinced, we may not be convinced, but there's no evidence. It's always had to be taken on trust. Orwell tells the truth, he says he did this, we may therefore believe he did this. There's no evidence. The few times in the text, so down at Paris, London, where he does name names or at least give enough information that you have some idea of where he's talking about, unfortunately, the records have been lost. The workhouse records, the casual ward records for Romford, Edmonton have vanished. But there is now finally a piece of documentary evidence which is being handed out as I speak. I discovered year before last now, in the London Metropolitan Archives, the court record from Old Street Magistrates Court for December 1931. December 1931, of course, was when, or well, the counting clink, he attempted to be arrested for being drunk and disorderly, drunk and incapable. Four or five pints, the best part of a bottle of whiskey. It was quite a small bottle of whiskey. <laughs> that, that dangerous attempt was picked up by the police, taken to Bethnal Green Police Station, so the weekend, Monday morning, Old Street Police Court, he was seen by the magistrate. Somewhat disappointed, as he didn't get sent to prison, um, couldn't pay the six shilling fine, but was let out because he was kept in over the weekend. What's being handed out to you is the first piece of documentary evidence ever discovered that demonstrates that any of all worlds down out experience is true. The first time it's no longer necessary to believe in him because we know he's telling the truth. What all were right in quick is where the charge sheet was filled up, I told the story I always, always tell, namely that my name was Edward Burton and my parents kept a cake shop in Glithborough, where I had been employed as a clerk in a draper's shop, that I had had the sack of drunkenness, and my parents, finally getting sick of my drunken habits, had turned me adrift. I added that I'd been working as an outside port at Billingsgate, and having unexpectedly knocked up six shillings on Saturday, had gone on the raffle. If you would like to look at the ninth entry on the document you now have, book you have, and you will now be putting this step in the you will see Edward Burton, fish porter, drunken capable. Um, Bethnal Green Police Station, that's the um, name of influential complainant, PC 620I William BG, BG being Bethnal Green. Um, NFA, no fixed address, so you can say he's homeless, and it gives the name of Edward Burton. Also, it's a six shilling fine he talked about, or one day, or he'd already served at that point, and drunk and capable, 9.20 pm. This, is, again, I repeat, is the first piece of external evidence for any of Orwell's social investigation. That in itself, I think, is quite an interesting fact. It shows, the one piece of evidence we have, it shows he's telling the truth about what he did. Oh, sorry. It shows it's te he's telling the truth when he writes about what he did. Every fact relating to Edward Burton matches what he says. There's a slight inconsistency, really, about the age. It says he was... 29, he was 28 at the time. That time I can't explain. Other than that, this, said, this does show that he's telling the truth. But more than that narrow point, regarding the general question of his reportage, how accurate he is, we now know he's honest, we have external proof now that he's honest, we can also see how accurate he was. Because in Clint, he details the other prisoners with whom he found himself waiting to go before the beak. Now it's possible to identify nearly all these people. Um, again, I'm going to have to ask you to do the work for me here and look at them before you put it in front of you. So it talks about an ugly Belgian youth charged with obstructing traffic with the barrow. Number 16, you'd like to refer to that, please. Uh, Pierre Sussman, age 20, pleading guilty to obstructing Shoreditch High Street with the Costa Barrow. He talks about the youth who had stabbed his tart in the stomach. She was likely to recover, we heard. They heard the chains clinking cell next door. Extraordinary clanking noise. Number five, 
Joseph William McGowan, like your old friend Polisher, but they were, they were in fact wrong about the crime. He wasn't accused of attempted murder or wounding, but of murder, as you can see in Florence and Gammon. The florid smart man, the public house governor, he talks about with a bezel for Christmas club money, um, paying all back the £12, is Harry Templeman, um, landlord of the bit of Wakefield in Bethnal Green, as the think is now closed down. Interestingly, here there is a discrepancy between what all the rights in Clink and what it says in the record in front of you. All the claims that Templeman has embezzled Christmas Club money, but the record says that he stole his bailey, £400, eight shillings and a penny from the Vicar of Wakefield's loan club. This is a tiny difference, a tiny discrepancy, Christmas Club, loan club. But I think it's quite important. Because if we were being cynical, if we wanted to um, doubt, we could say, well, all what Orwell says matches what's in the record, maybe it's not the record. But if he got his information from a source like this, he wouldn't have made that sort of tiny mistake. That's the sort of minor inconsistency you make by when, you, when your information comes from listening to people. It's not the sort of mistake you make if you're doing what doing now and looking at the record. Um, similar discrepancy when he talks about the Duke who had been a kosher, um, the buyer of Smithfields for a kosher butcher. After working seven years with the same employer, he suddenly misappropriated £28, went up to Edinburgh, I don't know where Edinburgh, and had a good time with tarts. This is, I can't remember what number, I think Harry Evers, butcher, two counts in embezzlement on 30th December 1931, his employer Louis Rosenberg. He was charged on the 20th of December, so yes, 30th of December, 20th of December, enough time to go to Edinburgh for fun. But the first count was for £1, 10 shillings, second £1, 4 shillings, 10 pence. Total £2, 14 shillings, 10 pence. A far cry from £28. Pounds. So, you know, we may wonder quite what's happening here. Maybe Paul went wrong. Maybe he was boasting, trying to make himself look like a greater criminal than he was. Maybe he did steal more money the police never found out about. But again, these inconsistencies, these discrepancies, I would argue, suggest a greater degree of accuracy because he's sitting there listening to people talk. He's not copying things off the charge sheet. Unfortunately, some of the other people mentioning Clink don't allow such ideas, easy identification. There's the wonderful description of the extraordinary hairy creature who's either deaf or dumb or spoken no English. The temptation, given the second possibility Orwell gives for his silence, because he's English, is to identify him with Chin Yen, um, who was charged, well, I think it's really quite funny, but I think he shouldn't, charged with having committed unnecessary suffering for four fouls at Bethnal Green Road. <laughs> but then, if we think, you know, the London section, in down at Paris and London, Orwell's remarkable ethnological, ethnological precision when he identifies by sight, presumably from his time in Burma, between Chinamen, Chittagonian Lascars, Dravidians selling silk scarves, even a few Sikhs, not goodness knows how, had he seen Chin, had this been Chin Yen, who presumes to have been Chinese, one suspects he would have said this person is Chinese. As he doesn't say it, I think we can't really identify this deaf and dumb hairy creature, alas. Some of the others, again, you can't really identify, you can limit them down, and I presume everyone now does have a copy of this document. It's a job you can do yourself almost. You sit down with a clink and try and work out exactly who's being referred to. Sometimes it's more likely than others. Sometimes you can't really come to a firm conclusion. There is, though, one big problem. So far, everything from that document, read against clink, or was being accurate, or being truthful. It's good reportage. There's one point, though, where it would appear something else is going on. He, at some point, reproduces a conversation between many called Snout and Charlie. Although in the manuscript, Snout is also called Charlie. He changed his mind who's who called what. These people I cannot identify. There is no obvious pair or pair who could be noticed now from Charlie. They would appear not to match 
anyone on that record. But it's also interesting that in Clink, um, he, he reports a song that Snap was now that sings. Tap, tap, tappy, tap, I'm a perfect devil at that, tapping him here, tapping him there. I've been tapping him everywhere. The same song, though, this isn't the only time that song appears in Orwell's work, which is a dangerously vast edition. It's also found in a letter he wrote to Dennis Collins, 27th of August 1931. So, same year as this, but late summer rather than in December. So he writes in this letter, the songs I have heard this time around Louisiana Bum, which is American, also one about tap, tap, tappy, tap. I have heard the for that, tapping in the air, tapping in there, I've been tapping everywhere. Tappy will beg, perhaps an old musical song. And this, curious about it, and the fact much earlier, obviously suggests this is the first time he hears the song. So, possibly he did hear the song twice, but given that it's almost impossible, it is impossible, to match South and Charlie's description with anyone on this record, I strongly suspect that what he's done here is adding, he's added an episode that he'd witnessed really a conversation he'd overheard in August, he'd added to fill out what was really otherwise really quite a short piece, click thing that never really published. But had it not had this Stanford Charlie episode added which comes at the end, it would have been too short. So he, he was bulking it out with previously recorded, previously gathered material. Now, none of this is certain, um, but what I think we do have here, now everyone here I would imagine, just as I do, we find all well believable. We trust him. Um, we, we believe what he writes. But from the nitpicking academic point of view, there always has been a problem that you can't prove it. You know he's telling the truth, but you can't demonstrate this. Now, for the first time, it is possible though, to demonstrate what everyone has always thought. Don't doubt everyone in this room has always believed that Orwell is honest because it matches exactly everything that we match matches what is on that document. Okay. My name's Alan Clack. Yeah. And you, you were a policeman, I believe. I was, I was a policeman, yes, and in particular. I was a police sergeant at Bethnal Green in the early 1960s. Okay. What did you think of the, the talk we just had? Well, I, th I was absolutely amazed that uh, Luke was able to find the records from Old Street Magistrates Court from yeah. 1931. And everything that I've read of George Orwell's account of his time with the police and that call always seemed absolutely, totally accurate to everything that I remember from that time. Nobody, uh, uh, the only person who could describe it all like that would have to be somebody who'd been there. Yeah. Describing what it was like in the uh, prison van and what happened at court, absolutely spot on. Yeah. 